I'm going to be talking to you today about work I've been doing as part of a larger research effort, program project, that Albi has organized very ably for many years. And although we do take in my laboratory multiple approaches, I would say our expertise is really to try to model diseases such as Alexander disease in the fruit fly and try to learn um, things, basic things, about the disorders from the fruit fly. So many of you are probably thinking, why on earth do you imagine um, that you can study diseases of this very complex organ, the brain, in this tiny little fruit fly? You all know fruit flies, so when fruit's been sitting around for too long, get these guys buzzing. You all know how small they are. This is not to size. Um, and I think the basic answer to that question about why we think it's a good idea is just to tell you or remind you if you already know that Although um, we look a lot different from a fruit fly, amazingly enough, a lot of the basic cellular processes, including most of the basic important cellular processes in the brain, are highly conserved from the fruit fly to us. And it actually only takes about doubling the number of genes that you use from around 15,000 in the fruit fly to 30,000 in humans. Um, to make this complex organ. And what that means is that many basic processes are very well conserved. So that's our rationale for um, why we think it might work, why we think it might be helpful, um, or, or it might work in terms of giving, giving us useful insights. But why do we want to do it? You're going to hear um, from Albie and Tracy and Shushan about all the other very interesting and powerful ways we have of studying Alexander disease using rodents or even uh, tissue cells from patients themselves. So why do we even need to bother with a fruit fly? And um, here's why. Because they're very small, and I'm going to show you why that's helpful. Um, they're cheap, and I'm sure you can all understand why cheap is better than expensive. So we can do a lot more experiments. And they're, and they're very fast. So it takes only 10 days to go from one adult fruit fly to the next generation of adult fruit fly. Very quick. So what does that allow us to do? It allows us to do um, a couple of important things, but the first important thing I'm going to tell you about is it allows us to do what's called a comprehensive genetic analysis. And this, is a, this kind of analysis is outlined in schematic form here. This is exactly the kind of analysis that was just um, awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017 for understanding circadian rhythms. And so it's this Nobel Prize winning strategy we're going to try to apply to Alexander disease. And what does this strategy entail? Well, every um, process that goes on in your body is actually a cascade of different biochemical and cellular events. So we start off here, and I've outlined this with neurons alive, or we could say alive and functional, and that's good. Um, something goes awry in Alexander disease, but it's not just one thing. It's not just, it does start with GFAP, but there are many other events that occur before the neurons and glia are dysfunctional enough that nerve cells die and patients become symptomatic. So there's a little schematic diagram of all the things that have to happen. And of course, as scientists and as people who are interested in developing therapies, it's key for us to know what all these different processes are so we can target them. How is that done? Well, with genetics, you just knock out a part of the pathway and you rescue the neurons. And if we can figure out what's the name of the gene that when we knocked out rescued the neurons, we can understand what protein it encodes, we can understand the function of that protein, and ultimately, of course, our hope and why we do this at all is that we can develop a therapy that targets that particular protein. So that's really why we want to use fruit flies. And now I think you can understand why it's so important that we have something that's small and cheap and fast because these steps have to be done again and again and again to be comprehensive. And that's where the model organisms, such as fruit flies, really come into play. Um, and this is just says in words what I was just talking to you about, so we call this our genetic approach. Um, and to do that, though, first of all, we're going to have to have a starting point. So our starting point is going to be to model Alexander disease in Drosophila. And how do we even think about modeling a disease that's so complicated in this simple model organism? Well, what we do is we think about what Jim Goldman just told us about Alexander disease, and we think about the key features of the disease, so there are unfortunately seizures, as you know. We understand the genetics, which is related to mutations in GFAP. And we understand, as Dr. Goldman told you, the pathology where we lose um, myelin, axons, and to some extent, neurons. 
Then we have these blobs that you're going to see again in just a moment, these Rosenthal fibers. So these are some of the key features of Alexander disease. And interestingly enough, although you may doubt it, I'm going to convince you that these are all things you can make a fruit fly with Alexander disease have. And that's what we've done. So we started with the genetics that Dr. Goldman showed you, and we expressed human GFAP, and I'm going to focus really on the human GFAP with mutations, so that's what causes Alexander disease in patients. We expressed that in fruit fly glial cells, because that's, as Jim again told you, where normal human GFAP is. And what do we see? Well, we see something that's amazingly similar, given that it's a fruit fly. We see seizures. We see age-dependent death of both glia and also in a, in a, a cell non-autonomous way, so in a directed way, um, neurons. And we see Rosenthal fiber-like inclusions. Um, the other thing, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, because of work uh, from people like Jim and Albie over the years, we do know some information about how Alexander disease occurs, and it turns out our fruit flies show these same molecular and cellular um, tags. So let me just show you a few of these phenotypes. So what is a seizure in a fruit fly? How do we look at it? How do we do that? Um, experimentally, what we do is we have a vial. So these vials are so tall and so um, big around, so they're pretty small. You can fit lots of them in a relatively small incubator. It's like a fridge. Um, and we take that vial, and what we do is we just shake the flies up really fast and hard, and we do that with a vortexer. Um, so that's fine to do in a fruit fly. You have to be careful about doing that in a mouse or a rat, but it's okay in a fruit fly. And when you do that, um, the flies get seizures and they fall on their backs, they might flap their wings, they might um, move their legs rhythmically and very quickly. So that's a seizure. And we can count the number of animals that have seizures. And the Alexander disease animals have many more seizures after this procedure than normal animals. What about the blobs? Thank you, Jim. I can call them blobs. Um, so these Rosenthal fiber-like inclusions, this is one of my favorite slides. This shows you um, two sets of inclusions. One set of inclusions, which in, uh, one shows you this H&E stain, this pink stain we use. The other shows you the very high power electron microscopy. One set of inclusions is from human patient. The other set of inclusions is from our fruit fly model of Alexander disease. Um, and I know that Jim knows which is which, um, but it might be hard for other people um, to tell which is which because they look so similar. And these are, by the way, shown at the same magnification. I have no idea now. Oh, you do. You totally do. Don't say that. You know that this is the fruit fly inclusion because the mitochondria is so well preserved. So it's not postmortem tissue. Little in neuropathology joke there, sorry. So um, it, it's hard to sit to know, and that the inclusions are really very similar. So they look very similar, um, and then all of these features give us confidence that if we use this model to try to understand the disease, use all the powerful tools we have, at the end of the day, we'll come up with something useful for patients. Um, the other thing that we can do that's very helpful, um, just procedurally, is we can look directly at the brains and look at glial cells and neuronal cells that are dying, and we can mark them with, with stains that allow us to be very quantitative when looking at the brain tissue to determine if our treatments or our genetic um, manipulations are having an effect. Uh, so I told you very schematically about this approach to use genetics to try to understand underlying this uh, biochemistry and cell biology and discover targets. This is a little bit more real-to-life model of how that happens. We make our Alexander disease model, then we make other mutations in those same animals that make things better or worse. We identify these modifiers, and then I'm not going to focus so much on mammalian homologs in this particular talk, but that's very important, obviously, to make sure that whatever we found in the fruit fly is relevant to actual patients. Um, and just a schematic to show you the kinds of things that we've discovered. Um, we, and, and many of these things also were discovered by others. When we do this kind of modeling where we make our Alexander disease fruit fly with these Rosenthal fiber blobs in it, um, we've in particular in our laboratory have suggested that they're signaling by a molecule called nitric oxide to neurons to um, make these neurons dysfunctional and ultimately die. Other things that we've done in particular in my laboratory have been to look at mechanotransduction signaling, so signaling that happens in glia when they're stretched too much or their cell bodies or borders are stretched perhaps by these inclusions. 
Um, but in the last couple of minutes, um, what I wanted to spend just a, a little bit of time on is go into a little bit more detail about the other things that you can do in Drosophila. And not only can you do the genetics, which is really the main reason that people use model organisms like Drosophila, but you also can do pharmacological analyses. And I'll just show you a couple of slides about an experiment we did there. So this is obviously um, much more rapidly translatable to patients. Um, so what we did is we did a drug screen in our Drosophila model that I've explained to you in some detail. We started with a relatively modest number of compounds, around 2,000 compounds, and we chose to start with compounds that are a special group of molecules. These are drugs or drug-like molecules that either have, uh, that have already been approved by the USDA for applications in other diseases, not Alexander disease, but in other diseases, or they are molecules, um, some, it sounds like some of uh, patients have already in the audience um, or children of people in the audience have already taken things that are um, supplements. So these would be things that do not necessarily have to have USDA approval because they're already being sold as dietary supplements or other things. So that's the group of compounds. We chose that group of compounds with the hope that if we found anything, it would be more, it would be quicker to translate that into the clinic because there would be less regulatory work required. So we went through this group, and I told you about these little vial of fruit flies. So again, this is why being small and cheap is really helpful. You can take these individual vials of fruit flies. We can now supplement their food with the drug that we're going to administer. And we can put in groups of 12 to 15 individuals in one little vial. And that really helps us out a lot. Then we age them for 10 days, so our time course is relatively quick. Um, and then in this particular experiment, we did something a little bit laborious, but it was possible to do it, is we took each of those little brains and we cut it up on what we call a microtome into thin sections, and then we examined cell death in each of those brains and looked for compounds, obviously, that reduce cell death. We came up with a limited number of compounds that were reliable, so when we retested them, we would get the same result again and again. Um, and this just shows you a list of these compounds. Again, all um, FDA approved or not requiring FDA approval. And we focused, um, just take you through a couple of experiments focusing on one of these compounds. So because um, cholinergic signaling is very important for these astrocytes that are key players in the disease, we decided to focus our initial efforts on a molecule that um, interrupts signaling by acetylcholine. And one of the, the things then we can move rapidly to do, so we have this molecule that came out of the screen. We think we might know what it does, but we're not sure. So we can use our fruit fly models to say, okay, well, if it's blocking this particular neurotransmitter, then other molecules that block that neurotransmitter should work too. And that's what I'm showing you here. And molecules that activate that neurotransmitter system should make things worse. And that was true. And we could do that relatively rapidly. Um, we can then combine the pharmacological approach with the genetic approach, and genetics is like a scalpel. Pharmacology may be like a hammer, genetics is like a scalpel, it's a little more precise generally. So we can use our genetic tools to also suggest that we've identified the right molecule, um, the, identified the right pathway, so we can genetically block the receptor. We pharmacologically, with a drug, blocked it. Um, first, then we use genetics to block that same receptor, and also we're able to rescue the toxicity in our animal model, and we can block molecules that talk to that receptor. So it's all just to really um, just make sure that we know what the drug is doing, and that's very important for moving ultimately into treatment, that we really know what pathway that drug is targeting. So um, with that, I think I'm going to oh, wow wrap up just on time um, and re recap for you what I've told you, that one of the major things we do in my laboratory is use this tiny, tiny, cheap, and fast fruit fly to try to model key features of human neurologic disease. And today I've been telling you about, obviously, about Alexander disease. And that once we have that, those models, um, which can be amazingly faithful to the human disorder, given the organism we're working with, uh, we can use um, a combination, either genetic uh, analysis, pharmacological screening, or I showed you a combination of those two approaches 
to try to identify new therapeutic targets and maybe even directly new therapies by drug screening. And then what I haven't spent as much time on, because I know other speakers will, is that what we then do, and then we work with people like Albi, Shushan, Tracy, to um, take any insights, potential insights we've gained from Drosophila into rodent model systems, into human uh, astrocytes and make sure that those same pathways are conserved and I think we've had a number of successes in that area uh, but I've just told you about how we get the process started and then I want to stop uh, by thanking a postdoctoral fellow in my lab Li Chen Wang who did uh, a lot of this very nice work that I've shown you um, and again thank Alby uh, very much for organizing the wonderful program project that we've worked uh, under for many years uh, without Alby, I don't know that any of this would have happened. <laughs> Certainly not the stuff I've been doing. Um, and the other members of the program project are there, and you'll hear from them later today. Questions about flies. How do you get the disease into the body? Like, I know it's not like the actual disease, but just in general, like they're so tiny. So that's the wonderful thing about fruit flies. Um, people have worked on the genetics for so long, it's really very easy for us to take the human gene, transplant it into the fruit fly, and then the fruit fly starts making that mutant, the, the GFAP with the mutation that causes disease in patients. So we put the mutant GFAP into the fruit fly using all the tools people you, prescribe. Like, take, like, human blood and kind of give them a blood transfusion and, like, do something like that? Or, like, I mean, I guess not. Well, you know, I guess what we would try to do is find um, things that are abnormal. You know, so an interesting, an interesting thing would be to say, well, if you had something that made a patient worse or a patient better, maybe something in the blood, maybe not, um, could you then put that into your fruit fly and analyze it? And those are the kinds of things that are very interesting and, and, and can definitely be done. Absolutely. Yeah, try to find things that change what happens in a patient and ask how that's working in the fly, and then hopefully you could understand it, right? Yep. Here's a question for that. Yes, um, when the doctor was discussing about her pharmacy, she said that she had experimental tool on fruit flies. I sort of established parallelism with my experience with our daughter, who is an Alzheimer's disease patient, because when she was 10 years old, we sort of went through a hyperbaric oxygen therapy in California. And the doctor in that hyperbaric oxygen therapy in California also complemented this type of therapy with food supplements. And That's right. So yeah. we Very don't common. have your scientific eyes, but yeah, those are common that I just share with you. Yeah. I wonder if the doctor, um, if I wonder what effect could it be with the fruit fly? Well, so it's interesting that 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 library, which is just all these different drugs, had has a lot of the probably the whatever dietary supplements you were given are in that library. That's one of the sort of attractive things about the library. Um, that none of those things came out at the end as being helpful in our fruit flies, but uh, that doesn't mean they're not helpful. But it was a reason that we looked at those compounds. Um, and we actually have had success, not in Alexander disease, but in other, another disorder that we modeled. We actually did have success finding one of the dietary supplements to be useful. And then we were able to use the fruit flies to say, well, why is that? And can we identify the mechanism? It didn't happen in this particular case, but it would have been wonderful. Do you notice that, like, if you're feeding, I guess, what do you guys feed the fruit flies? Oh, that's or, one reason they're so cheap. They eat cornmeal and like, sugar. Is it that's more great. Organic type thing, or is it like stuff that's more processed, or do you notice a difference in them? If you know, so it's actually very interesting. You could try different kinds of diets. You know, again, none of those individual compounds came out, but you could try different diets, and sometimes people do that um, in fruit flies. That's not something my lab does a lot of, but people give more energy or less energy or different kinds of energy. Those are all things that can be done. It actually would be quite interesting to do. We just yeah, haven't done I'm it. I'm wondering almost like if like, pesticides can make it, you know, food that's grown with it progress faster than, you know. So people absolutely, um, this is particular, some, some 
neurodegenerative diseases, people have linked them to pesticides specifically. So that's an area of great interest that a lot of people work in. You absolutely can do that. You can feed them to the flies and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. There's one in the back there. Yeah, so when you were talking about those 1900 compounds that you tried and four came out yeah. positively, yep. but then they didn't work? The other oh, vast oh, majority no, of them right. did not work. Yeah, the vast majority just didn't work. But it's the true. That did work are still in progress. So we are trying to work on them, um, and one of our goals is to, uh, on the ones that worked, is to try to see if we can get positive data in other higher organisms to support the idea that they would be helpful. Working with Tracy, I didn't show you this data, but working with Tracy, we had some preliminary data that, that the pathway I presented to you might have some positive effects in mice, um, but those are experiment, but more work needs to be done there. Oh, okay. so just to follow up on that, some of those compounds are used actually in dries up the secretions, so, um, some patients that have a lot of secretions are on similar compounds or those compounds, and they're also used, a couple of those compounds are used for psychiatric disease, whether it's anxiety or depression. Um, you know, clinically, I think, you know, we haven't been looking to see whether those um, help Alexander disease and, and the, the numbers and measurements that we're doing. Um, most of them are just sort of right now symptomatic therapies, and we haven't seen a dramatic turnaround in patients that are on those therapies. So they, they are actually, those ones in particular are actually used. I can't say that on a clinical without any measurements or, or, or anything that we've seen, a reversal of um, disease or um, it, it's mostly just kind of involved. Yes, but of course, as you know, um, real data on that takes a lot of patients and a lot of measurements. So in Parkinson's disease, for instance, um, compounds that were used for other indications in those patients have in fact been shown to be um, beneficial. Yeah. So that requires a lot of a lot of, yeah. a lot of work. Which is very grateful for so many of the families that have come to see us and we can capture that information. It, it seems like it's going to take a lot more than just one compound. So we can Absolutely, and that's great. That's why it's so great to have you all here and think about how some of these things can come together. Is there a website where we can follow the, where these supplements are and what they think they may do so we can stay up to date? My website doesn't have that information. I think that what I could um, tell you is to contact me directly. I don't know if what you have available. But. Uh, I would say anything you think is really important, we would put on our Facebook page. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to work on it until we have a cure.